Welcome to Old Treasures Made New, your devotional podcast on the go or at home, where we read the scriptures and reflect on them with those from the past. Today we're reading Mark 9, verses 30 to 37, and then through J.C. Ryle's expository thoughts on Mark. Please take a moment to pause and to ask the Holy Spirit to bring understanding and to apply what we hear. Mark, chapter 9, verses 30 to 37. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Then he sat down and called the twelve. And he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Let us mark in these verses our Lord's renewed announcement of his own coming, death, and resurrection. He was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. The dullness of the disciples in spiritual things appears once more, as soon as the announcement was made. There was good in the tidings as well as seeming evil, sweet as well as bitter, life as well as death, the resurrection as well as the cross. But it was all darkness to the bewildered twelve. They did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask. Their minds were still full of their mistaken ideas of their master's reign upon earth. They thought that his earthly kingdom was immediately to appear. Never are we so slow to understand as when prejudice and preconceived opinions darken our eyes. The immense importance of our Lord's death and resurrection comes out strongly in this fresh announcement which he makes. It is not for nothing that he reminds us again that he must die. He would have us know that his death was the great end for which he came into the world. He would remind us that by that death the great problem was to be solved, how God could be just and yet justify sinners. He did not come upon earth merely to teach and preach and work miracles. He came to make satisfaction for sin by his own blood and suffering on the cross. Let us never forget this. The incarnation and example and words of Christ are all of deep importance, but the grand object which demands our notice in the history of his earthly ministry is his death on Calvary. Let us mark in the second place in these verses the ambition and love of preeminence which the apostles exhibited. On the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. How strange this sounds! Who would have thought that a few fishermen and tax collectors could have been overcome by envious rivalry and the desire of supremacy? Who would have expected that poor men, who had given up all for Christ's sake, would have been troubled by strife and dissension as to the place and preeminence which each one deserved? Yet so it was. The fact is recorded for our learning. The Holy Spirit has caused it to be written down for the perpetual use of Christ's church. Let us take care that it is not written in vain. It is a dreadful fact, whether we like to allow it or not, that pride is one of the commonest sins which beset human nature. We are all born Pharisees. We all naturally think far better of ourselves than we ought. We all naturally imagine that we deserve something better than we have. It is an old sin. It began in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve thought they had not got everything that their merits deserved. It is a subtle sin. It rules and reigns in many hearts without being detected and can even wear the garb of humility. It is a most soul-ruining sin. It prevents repentance, keeps men back from Christ checks brotherly love, and nips in the bud spiritual desires. Let us watch against it and be on our guard. Of all garments, none is so graceful, none wears so well, and none is so rare 
as true humility. Let us mark in the third place the peculiar standard of true greatness which our Lord sets before his disciples. He says to them, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. These words are deeply instructive. They show us that the maxims of the world are directly contrary to the mind of Christ. The world's idea of greatness is to rule, but Christian greatness consists in serving. The world's ambition is to receive honor and attention, but the desire of the Christian should be to give rather than receive, and to attend on others rather than be attended on themselves. In short, the man who lays himself out most to serve his fellow man and to be useful in his day and generation is the greatest man in the eyes of Christ. Let us strive to make a practical use of this heart-searching maxim. Let us seek to do good to our fellow men and to mortify that self-pleasing and self-indulgence to which we are all so prone. Is there any service that we can render to our fellow Christians? Is there any kindness that we can do to them to help them and promote their happiness? If there is, let us do it without delay. Well would it be for Christendom if empty boasts of churchmanship and orthodoxy were less frequent and practical attention to our Lord's words in this passage more common. The men who are willing to be last of all and servants of all for Christ's sake are always few. Yet these are the men who do good, break down prejudices, convince infidels that Christianity is a reality, and shake the world. Let us mark in the last place what encouragement our Lord gives us to show kindness to the least and lowest who believe in his name. He teaches us this lesson in a very touching manner. He took a child in his arms and said to his disciples, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. The principle here laid down is a continuation of that which we have just considered. It is one which is foolish to the natural man. Flesh and blood can see no other way to greatness than crowns and rank and wealth and high positions in the world. The Son of God declares that the way lies in devoting ourselves to the care of the weakest and lowest in his flock. He enforces his declaration by marvelous words which are often read and heard without thought. He tells us that to receive one child in his name is to receive Christ, and to receive Christ is to receive God. There is rich encouragement here for all who devote themselves to the charitable work of doing good to neglected souls. There is encouragement for everyone who labors to restore the outcast to a place in society, to raise the fallen, to gather together the ragged children whom no man cares for, to pluck the worst of characters from a life of sin, like brands from the burning, and to bring the wanderers home. Let all such take comfort when they read these words. Their work may often be hard and discouraging, they may be mocked, ridiculed, and held up to scorn by the world. But let them know that the Son of God marks all they do and is well pleased. Whatever the world may think, these are they whom Jesus will delight to honor on the last day. That is the end of Rao's expository thoughts for these verses. Let us carefully consider what we have heard today. And may the Lord be pleased to bring the growth for His glory. In considering what we've just heard, would you prayerfully ask yourself and others the following questions? First, do we consider the cross the key to understanding our Lord's primary work? Second, are we aware of the dangers of the naturally besetting, easily disguised, and soul-ruining sin pride is in our lives? Does it shock us that pride can be disguised as humility? Do we watch against it? Do we apply the humbling medicine of meditating on the cross of Christ to it? Third, do we truly believe that being the servant of all is to be the greatest? Are we ready and eager to serve others when we see needs arise and are able to meet them? Or are we hesitant and reserved and calculated? And lastly, do we believe that when we receive one such child in his name, we receive Christ and God as well? 
What would believing this do to our serving others?